hello and welcome. Uh, my name is Vincent Ryan and I'm a psychotherapist based in Ireland. And today is one of our series of interviews with psychotherapists who work in experiential ways with their clients and use experiential thinking and models in their work. So today I'm speaking with Susan Warren Warshaw, who is a psychotherapist uh, uh, working in private practice in Woodland Hills, California. Um, Susan has developed um, a form of therapy that's called dynamic emotion focused therapy. Mm -hmm. And there's an, there's an institute uh, with that that offers training programs. Um, so, um, yeah, so I think, you know, maybe we can just get into it now, um, Susan. So you're very welcome and thanks for joining, joining us here. Thank you so much, Vincent. I'm delighted to be here. Yeah, I'm, I'm delighted that you can you can join join me here for this conversation today. So let's get started, like with this, uh, this, this sort of question here. How do you think about the way you work now with with with, with clients? Is it sort of um, is it an experiential way? And how important is experiential ways of working for you when you think about your work? Sure, it's very much experiential. And I'll say more about that in a moment. Um, it, I would also say that our priority is to be in attunement with the client and to create as much safety as we possibly can and hopefully to form a new kind of relationship um, that is nurturing and um, different from typically quite different from what people have, have experienced before. And when I think of like descriptive terms for how I practice, experiential is definitely one of them. And I also talk about being a shame sensitive therapy, uh, a compassion and attachment centered approach, uh, somatic and emotion focused and definitely psychodynamic. So there are a lot of ands to it. And when I say that it's um, deft is experiential, it is with a caveat in that I put a lot of emphasis on do I have the client's permission to work in the way I'm proposing. So I really like to let the client know uh, at an appropriate time in the first session, uh, the type of approach I'm suggesting. And I make it clear it is a suggestion and that I'm very interested in how it resonates for them. And um, I will say something like, uh, would it be okay with you if, as you're telling me about what's going on in your life, that we also take some moments to check in and see how, what, you, what you might be noticing in your body. Because I do find that what we experience physiologically uh, has a wealth of information that can help us. And also any rising emotions that you become aware of. And also maybe just checking in to see how uh, you and I are doing together, how you're feeling with me. And I wonder how that strikes you. How, how is that for you? And when I ask that question, I think I want to create a lot of space around it. I, I often see in therapy where people just start practicing whatever the therapy is. And, um, or they may begin to talk about, say, what somebody is, is, you know, that, uh, um, maybe that a person's short of breath or something about some observation. But we don't, we may not really have the permission to talk on that intimate a level. And I'm very aware that the, approach I'm suggesting is extremely intimate and it's often anxiety and shame provoking because we're inviting people to bring forth actually unconscious 
parts of themselves. You know, when you're looking at what's going on in our bodies, our feelings, you know, you're going to start tapping into the unconscious, the unknown uh, parts of the self that can feel scary or shameful. So I want to be sure, uh, I want to take time to see how this is all landing. And uh, once in a while, someone will say, I like it, I like it a lot, let's go for it. But more often, people express fear. Um, they uh, say, well, I'm willing to try, but I have no idea how to do it. This is not my strong suit. And I'm going to need to let them know that they will not be alone. And definitely, I'm going to be here as a guide if they would like to um, give it a try. Um, but I don't want to push or pressure people into this approach. But when they agree, then it becomes very experiential. Yeah, I really hear that, the importance of the permission and really tuning into the other person, where, like where you're at, where you're, where you're at with them, where they're, where they're at with you, and that it's their, it's their choice, their agenda. It's, it's, it's for them. That's right. Yeah. I want to make it very clear that I'm okay, whatever they wish to do. I never want to go someplace that they don't choose to go. So that kind of feedback is very important. And the other thing that I will ask permission for is, uh, would it also be okay? Because I'm, again, I'm aware that working in this way is new for most people. And typically, uh, you know, we encounter, it could be barriers, you know, some things that make it difficult to work in this way, would it be okay if we talk about that too? And if you'd like, I could go into um, like a session. Yeah. Or yeah. Would, yeah. That's what I was going to ask. Next. Yeah. Susan, yeah. If you'd like to. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, there's a woman approaching 40 comes into my office and she looks very together and she sits down erectly, you know, and begins to talk in this very rapid, pressured speech. She's had this series of um, horrible breakups and had a recent breakup, but there have been a long line of them. She was, you had, there was a sense of desperation about her. Um, she did have, she did have two kids divorced. Um, but she was terrified that she was never going to get married. And um, uh, as she's talking, I'm finding that it's almost hard for me to process because there is such a deluge of information. And um, it's like swirling around my ears and not exactly entering into them. <laughs> And she's obviously not able to make eye contact with me. I get the sense that she hardly knows I'm in the room. It's like she's talking at me. And we have zero relationship. And so what's going on inside of me is how can I penetrate this? How can I make a connection? It's not the content of what she's saying, but how can we find a way to connect? And so I did interrupt her at one point, which actually I had to interrupt because she didn't stop. And um, I said, what I just said to you, would you mind if, uh, how would you feel? if we might also, as you're talking, begin to notice, et cetera, your internal experience. And she immediately said something like, I know I talk too much. People tell me that all the time, that uh, I go very fast. And I said, well, I don't have any problem with that. You know, and 
um, I'm just aware that there are some very important parts of you that might be getting left behind. And I'm just suggesting if we might make room for all of you. And we, we, we arrived at an agreement where it made sense to her and she was on board with it. And then I could, with her permission, begin to talk about her shortness of breath. It looked like she was quite short of breath and that must be an uncomfortable state for her body. And it seemed like she felt a lot of pressure. And she said, yes, I've got so much I, I need to tell you. And I told her, I'm very interested. It's all very important. And, but again, would it be okay if we give attention? Again, I mean, the shortness of breath. And the other thing I said, am I picking this up right? But it looks like you might, it might be a little hard to make eye contact with me. And that whole exchange put her in touch with how much shame she was carrying around. And she starts making these various, you know, she, she tells me that she's mortified, actually. She feels absolutely mortified to be revealing all of these failures in her life. She's, she imagines, I've got it all together. It's like, how, what, how am I thinking of her? Um, and I showed a lot of compassion. It's a really key component of what I emphasize in the, in the work I do is compassion for these barriers, these, uh, pro, you know, these processes that are so debilitating and uh, undermining in a person. And she started, uh, you know, I could say at some point, maybe we'll talk about the therapeutic transfer of compassion for herself. But she started to embody compassion for herself when she saw my compassion. And she started to cry. And she really connected with how much shame she has been carrying her whole life. And then she free associates that her parents treat her like a very young child. They take care of her in all kinds of ways, but they supervise all of her major decisions. And um, she, she started to see how deprived she was, essentially of a sense of herself. You know, she really had no relationship to herself. And, and she saw how she was really not able to relate to me either in that state. And it, uh, it, it, it just turned out to be the beginning of a wonderful course of work. And I want, I just want to say, Vincent, that in that session, because I remember it vividly, I remember thinking, okay, we went from here to there. And what was it that what, what really happened that allowed for that? And this idea of the healing triad came to my mind, which is a core concept in depth. And it starts with, well, we have to have the permission. You know, that's out of respect that the person is choosing to join us in this kind of a partnership. But then we have to be able to raise awareness of the barriers. You know, what is, what is really causing her suffering? And I've used a metaphor with a, a lot of my, my clients that called the parasitic vine. And it's, it's the parasitic vines are the barriers that strangle the self. It's like if you think of a very healthy, robust tree trunk surrounded by these strangling vines. And um, I consider the vines to be shame, anxiety, 
toxic forms of guilt and self-protective strategies, which are like classic defense mechanisms. Um, but um, the, somehow we need to raise awareness of uh, how these operations are just destroying and debilitating the self. And then I think to do this in a way that is most likely to work, we have to convey compassion for the suffering. This is the triad. It's, there, it's awareness, then therapeutic transfer of compassion for self. We can't talk about these barriers from a detached place. You know, like, do you notice that you're talking rapidly? Or, you know, you've become very anxious. Uh, do you notice your shortness of breath? I think we need to convey that we really care. That it is, it is sad for her to be short of breath when she's talking, to have this much fear just talking to me. Um, oftentimes, it, you know, the compassion, I think, originates in the therapist. Rarely is it originating in the client. And so it's through the patients or, the, or clients' experience of our compassion that hopefully they begin to internalize it. And all of a sudden, like when she started crying and saying, oh, my God, I've had so much shame all my life. She was in a state of compassion mm -hmm. for herself. So she'd taken it into her. And out of that caring for herself, often, I mean, the, to me, one of the most amazing aspects of doing therapy is when the will comes online. It's like this amazing healing force that begins to assert itself. And it's like, I don't want to go through life, this child anymore. You know, um, I, I don't want to be hiding and limping and I don't want it. And that's the will. And that's when we're kind of off and running when that happens. So yeah, wow. I'm I know that's a lot. <laughs> well, no, it's 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 so rich, and um, for all that to happen in one session, in uh, take it a first session. It was the first session, yes. I'm I'm kind of blown away by that. Hmm. Um, yeah. It, well, you know, and these are these part these things that happen that we cannot predict, and that are part of this amazing healing force and if we can just shed some light on what is tying people up and they can see it and we can really express our caring and they can start to feel it sometimes it's almost like that tree trunk starts expanding <laughs> and it's like let me out of here you know and we it's, it's that's the part i have no control over and we just stand back. Yeah, I like that idea of the will. Um, and it's something that doesn't often get talked about so much in therapy nowadays. I know some schools of therapy and some people talk about it, and you're talking about it today, and that's really valuable. But yeah, some like a person really re refinding a will that's kind of broken or, or kind of just, just the exhaustion yeah. sometimes of years of heartbreak and just not knowing what to do about it and just to find real like kind of a gutsy kind of rebellion right really, exactly it's really valuable really healing actually isn't it it can be very you know i would i call it helping people connect to them a sense of themselves it's a relationship to oneself and so often we don't even see that we're a self standing here you know, who's amazing and has value and is filled with resources. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. Because um, I suppose the trouble is, isn't it, that if we don't have that sense of self, we're, we're really focused on the other. Because right. we're going to be... Which is a very iffy proposition to guide your life based on the clues yeah. we pick up from the outside. 
which is different to relating to the other, connecting. It's this kind of preoccupation. Oh, yeah. And yeah, it's just not, it's not really very healthy or comfortable way to, to live. Um, um, that sense of self, it comes up in lots of different theories um, that I've come across. Um, mm -hmm. You know, um, I suppose when I'm thinking about that triad that you talked about there, that, you know, there's this sort of like the permission and just how you're kind of negotiate that, negotiating that or, or sort of feeling your way into that at the start. That seems like the, the starting point for you. Is that right? Um, it, you know, it is. It really always is because um, I'm more interested in showing respect than anything else. <laughs> Um, it doesn't matter how many good ideas I have. You know, I, I want to help a person really become clear about what they truly hope for in our work. And that can take more than one session, you know, because so often people have no idea what they want. And um, but I don't want to be the expert that, oh, well, I see you need this. And I've got to see answer. And now let's proceed and do that. I, you know, I want it to be very collaborative. I want to be reinforcing that we are equals all the time. And that you do not have to agree with me. And what I think might work uh, may not be exactly the right thing. Uh, you know, I need your input too. And uh, but wherever you are is okay with me, including if you don't even want to do this. <laughs> and you know something, Vincent, I find it took me years to get into that place because I really wanted to help people. Sure. And <laughs> get busy doing that. Probably. Oh, get busy doing that and uh, give my answers to them. Now, I was just thinking about the right brain kind of approach, like where there's two right brains in the room, uh, two brains in the room with the right brain kind of active and a sort of a transmission maybe unconsciously off like holding that difficult experience together. So it's no longer just one. Absolutely. You know, I would say to therapists to maybe new to experiential work that um, to hang in with the discomfort that I, I will just speak for myself, that it was definitely involved going into new places for me. And uh, to just listen to stories and to make comments, there was a degree of detachment in the way I, I had worked previously. And this really engaged me. It was engaging both of us in a way that at one time I was unaccustomed to. And it was more activating. Some might say more work, uh, definitely more challenging. But um, I, it... And, and I will also say it took me a while before I actually had faith in the approach enough to believe it's really worth it. Yeah. But, of course, here I am. And uh, I, I can't imagine a more fulfilling way to be with people. And, you know, to, it's, it's so much more alive and dynamic and in the moment. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. I'm thinking about, you know, the sort of like the difference of each individual person as well, because, you know, when we have a sort of a, an idea about how to work and we have these ideas about shame or, you know, how, 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 you know, permission might operate or, you know, these kinds of things, defenses and barriers. But then yeah. every individual person is like completely there. You know, there is obviously like huge commonalities, but so different as well, I think. Oh, yeah. Oh, absolutely. And that's why I say, you know, you say I gives it an experiential approach. 
um, it's not going to be that way with every person. Mm. And um, there are some people who may be in a vegetative depression. I remember a guy who had had 26 ECT treatments and he really wanted to go back to it. And we could just could not do experiential work. He did not have the capacity uh, to do it. And for me to, in any way, be pushing him in that direction would would not have been right for him. Um, there are people with, let's say, severe impulse disorders where I'm not going to go deeply into what they're feeling, especially feelings of rage. I'm not going to do the full kinds of explorations yeah. that I would do with someone else. And uh, for some people, you know, they need to be on the cognitive level, yeah. you know, and uh, uh, they may need very supportive therapy or need certain types of regulation that's vital. Because I, I do think one of the biggest mistakes is if we miss dysregulation mm. and pursue any therapy that someone doesn't have the capacity to tolerate. Yeah. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. So like when I say it's an emo deft is emotion focused, it won't be emotion focused with someone who doesn't have that capacity. Yeah. You know, you have to have a certain capacity. Otherwise, it's just more dysregulation, isn't it? That's right. You do harm. Yeah. Yeah. So um, I may spend the bulk of the time <clears throat> in therapy building capacity. Yeah. before it really becomes deeply experiential or emotion focused yeah absolutely. yeah yeah um you know there's so many different directions we could go in here um and i i even just that last point about how you do that how how do you build that capacity <clears throat> do you see that yourself if that's you know my go-to place is the healing triad right so it starts with, as long as we have the alliance, the permission, we're not dragging somebody up a mountain with us. We have a partner. <clears throat> I would start with an awareness, like that woman who had such pressured speech and shortness of breath. And I'll, you know, begin to invite the person to tell me whatever they're noticing in their bodies. And, you know, you start going through the body. And as you, we know, we all know this, that anxiety is going to usually, not always, usually starts to drop as the observer comes online yeah. and the person can talk about their internal state and they're not having to hide it and are alone with it. And somebody starts noticing, well, my hand is twitching, uh, my leg is jumpy, uh, my heart's speeding up here. And I also think, you know, our tone of voice it can be very regulating and just that we're containing the experience. And yeah, tell me about that more and so then what happens yeah and so gosh and then i might go cognitive like wow we're talking about your sister and then um all of a sudden it seemed like it was really hard for you to think and we see how there's some um, uh, obviously some anxiety that would you agree i want to get the person talking too i don't want to just be delivering yeah um information but really engaging and it doesn't seem that way to you and that somehow just having feelings about your sister all of a sudden you couldn't think clearly that's the triangle of conflict by the way in Davin and that's a very valuable feeling leads to anxiety leads to defense and so on but um um there's such a variety of ways to bring down anxiety. Mm -hmm. And I use a lot of different ones, but I think it's really important 
that we pick it up. I mean, I, I remember one man, we're talking, um, all of a sudden, and it had to do with anger at someone, where he, which he was very, very avoidant. And um, his eye darted to the left, like his right. And, you know, there are these micro expressions, right, that the more you practice, the more we pick it up. Mm. And it was, you'd hardly even see it on a tape. I mean, it was like it happened in a millisecond. But <clears throat> just a very brief, his eye darted over there. And I said, what just happened there? You know, look like, and then he said, well, I start feeling like I might faint. Mm -hmm. And he's an older man who came in with panic attacks. He'd gone to the ER a number of times with fainting episodes. And I have to tell you, my anxiety shot up. I mean, I thought, oh, my God, is he all right? Yeah, yeah. You know, but it would have been very easy to have kept talking. Mm, and miss that sort of thing. And it, very easy to miss it. And then I would hate to think he could, he could have gotten very dysregulated, yeah. more dysregulated, you know. Mm. So picking up on these distressed states, you know, it's a big, big part of the work. Yeah, um, it's a form of care as well, isn't it? To be observant like that, it's, it's demonstrating that kind of attention is a real form of like embodied care, isn't it? As well. Oh yeah, mm. and it's very instinctive. Mm. And it was kind of interesting because um, I used a little bit of humor. I mean, none of this is consciously intended. But I just said, you know, we don't want you fainting. I don't want you fainting on us here. Something, it was something like that. Yeah. And we both laughed. Cool. And he said, well, I sure don't want to faint either. <laughs> and uh, he came back, you know. It really didn't take that long. And it was a step. Uh, he really developed a lot of capacity yeah. to allow himself to feel and to connect. Well, I, I wondered, before we go, I just wondered, would it be nice to say a little bit about this transference of compassion, maybe? Because I know you mentioned it earlier. And sure. Could you say a little bit about how that, how that is? How do, you, how do you experience that? Because I, I, I think it'd be a shame not to, not to like maybe finish on that, because that seems so important. And I think we all as therapists need to, to understand that more and to feel that more and get it more. So maybe would you like to say a little bit about that? Yeah, I'd love to. Yeah. I'd, I'd love to because it's um, a powerful phenomena for me yeah. when, when I experience it. And it's oftentimes, you know, we may have an enormous amount of caring that we're feeling for our client, but it's inside of us. And unfortunately, it doesn't do them a lot of good if they don't perceive it and are not able to receive it. Yeah. And I think of it like passing a baton in a race or something, you know, how you pass it over, the next person grabs it and takes it and runs with it. And uh, if the client doesn't see it and grab it and take it and run with it, it's kind of useless. So um, I pay a lot, a lot of attention to, to is the, the client internalizing my compassion, which, like I say, typically is going to originate within me. If they had a lot of compassion for themselves, they probably wouldn't be there. Yeah. So, um, and the compassion I speak of, um, it's actually not generalized, like just a general compassion for suffering. Although, of course, that's so important. 
but it's a particular type of suffering that I am emphasizing here, which is compassion for the suffering caused by, say, if somebody's very detached, or the, I've talked about a very intellectualized person who d- doesn't have a clue about what they're feeling and can't possibly share what they're feeling or have any idea what somebody else is feeling. And now that is a very deprived life in my estimation, you know, so. that that is a tragedy. Very lonely, probably. Yeah. Very lonely. And oftentimes you're going to see divorces and lost jobs and no friends or friends, friendships blowing up, whatever. There's going to be a trail of suffering. Yeah. And so that is the suffering that I particularly emphasize, which is how sad it is that um, it's talking about the parasitic vines again, that they're been wrapped around you, strangling your life force. And I think of a man who started the session telling me, you know, I have something I want to tell you about, but I, I just might have enough courage to do it. Hmm. Well, I don't know if I can. I, I, I don't know. I mean, uh, um, uh, there, you know, this was like, and his head is hanging down and he can't look at me. And, uh, uh, no, I just, I just don't know. Oh, and he was just in agony. Hmm. And I very purposely, did not directly encourage him to tell me Mm. because um, first of all, I want it to absolutely be his choice. Mm. I do not want him to do that to please me. That would be a violation. Right. You know, but um, I do want to reflect and empathize how sad it is to see his agony. He had so much agony about revealing these parts of himself that he was obviously afraid to reveal to me and maybe to reveal to himself as well. But there was something about bringing this out into the open that felt very dangerous to him. So I wanted to reflect my compassion for how agonizing this was for him and that it must obviously feel very threatening. And what what did he imagine might be the threat, you know? Yeah. Well, I think you might feel disgusted. You know, you might not even want to work with me. After I tell you this, I'm I'm thinking, oh, my goodness, no wonder this is so hard to tell me. Uh, That would be terrible, wouldn't it, if I were to be disgusted and Mm. to reject you when you would be taking such a risk. Yeah, like what kind of awful person would I be if I reacted that way? Oh, yeah. yeah. But also really empathizing with why this was so hard. Yeah. And that I wanted to let him know that truthfully, I didn't want him to tell me Mm -hmm. if he uh, did not feel ready to tell me. But again, I thought that was so sad, Mm -hmm. you know, that he felt he had to carry this by himself. And I asked him, um, how, just out of interest, how would you feel if you leave the session and you haven't told me? And he said he would not feel good and he would not get relief. And he said to me, like he said, I just begun thinking more of myself, feeling better about myself. And I like it Mm. and I want more of it. And there you had the will. Mm. See there, that's when that energetic, that will came online. And then he said, okay, I'm just going to go for it. And and what he told me was about a 
horrible type of self-degradation that he had done. Mm -hmm. And it opened up such doors about his guilt that that had turned to self-hatred and all the things he felt guilty about and the way he had been harming himself his whole life. And um, just the profound lack of compassion for himself that had actually led to everything, you know, that had caused his life to unravel. A profound lack of compassion. And I believe that it was in, in fact, you know, I actually showed that tape at my first international conference. And um, a person who trained me said to me, you know, that moment where you showed your sadness and compassion, I think, was the turning point Mm. in the whole work. Yeah. And I agree. I mean, I that's what I experience. Yeah. What I'm thinking about, just just my own kind of comment on that, Susan, and I, and I really like it, is like kind of how there could be an enactment of shame for him in telling you, like a kind of a degradation being kind of reenacted with you if he just went. Oh, yes. Whereas you kind of slowing down saying, no, let's let's pro- let's prioritize you here. And and you know and what you've been through and what you're needing help with, um, and right? The suffering that you've you've gone through to sort of honor that first of all before we get into the whatever the absolutely. The- and sometimes I will say things, like, and I think I did with him. You know, it is not me who's going to be disgusted. Mm. I mean, it is like so foreign to me to even imagine being disgusted when you are making such a valiant effort here to reveal yourself and trust yourself with me. Yeah. And you're in such pain and we're here to help you uh, get relief for this pain. I cannot imagine feeling disgust, but only just welcoming anything that will help you to find relief. So sometimes it's also clearing out these projections that uh, that's very common that people, you know, project that we're going to judge and not be able to handle. We'll be overwhelmed. We'll be burdened. It's a, it's a terror for people that prevents them from being free, experientially free. Yeah. Um, and I, I don't know if you said this to me when, when we first met or we, we said it in the interview, but I, I recall you saying that, is it possible to have a new kind of relationship or a new experience of relationship? Um, or is it going to be some kind of a repeat or some kind of, and isn't it so much that often? Right. Something different happen here than the same old humiliation or confusion or anxiety or, or anger. Or whatever. That's right. What would you kind of agree with that? Oh, I mean, completely. I remember when when he did start to really unblock. Uh, oh, my gosh. He went into some really profound places. But he had memories of his father, who at one time he actually thought of killing because he was such an abuser. Mm-hmm. And his, he'd be, if he'd be out in the yard, maybe playing basketball with his friends, his father would come out and he said he'd whistle to him like a dog mm-hmm. to come in. Yeah. And um, the uh, degree of humiliation mm-hmm. and just uh, total disregard that he had experienced was <laughs> horrendous. So um, that's what he knew. That's what was familiar. And he had really been directing that toward himself. He'd been having that kind of a relationship with himself, you know, that he was that disgusting. And that's why he degraded himself. That's why he committed those acts that he committed. Yeah, of 
course. It was tra- I mean, it was what really was one of the saddest things I ever heard. Yeah, yeah. I'm really struck by, you know, we, we talk about the experiential um, side of, of your work and our work, but the relational side of that. Like ah, the, the relational. Yeah, the experience of relation, relationship and connection and yeah, it's so close, so close to your your heart here. Obviously, I would love to add a little thing that you remind me of about this man. Okay, yeah. Yeah. so his he came in very depressed, uh, a second divorce underway, um, extreme social anxiety, etc., and this uh, we had some very challenging sessions very challenging but there was uh, some amazing breakthroughs for him and uh it was like at least a year after we terminated uh one of the things he he was a wonderful singer and he was with a band it wasn't his primary gig but he had been he, i mean he was professional and we were at a big open uh, center where we live and there was a big gathering and I'll be darned if he's not playing and singing. Wow, that's great. <laughs> and I said, Oh my God, you know, it's so-and-so. So we just, you know, I'm way off uh, to the side, um, is staying way in the back. Yeah. And all of a sudden he says, Somebody just entered, just came in, who means a lot to me. Wow, yeah. <laughs> Makes me want to cry. <laughs> oh. It honestly does. And he said, I'd like to dedicate this song to her. Yeah. And he sang Stand By Me, which is one of my favorite yeah. songs. Wow. That's oh. Amazing. So I can, you know, like right now I get chills and uh, sometimes I might get chills in a session. I think they always communicate something. Mm. I don't know if you agree with that, Vincent, but there's something about it. I don't get chills often, but. No, I, I do. I do. I do know what you mean. And I think sometimes when the relational, when the relationship just kind of reaches a resonance, it's kind of like, a, wow, that's really, you know, something. And um, yeah. yeah. And the and then just to add, I saw him another time. <laughs> and he was with a woman. And he didn't see me then. He's, they're holding hands and swinging. And they're swinging the hands. And I could see he just looks so relaxed mm. and happy. And we did cross paths. And I said, how are you doing? You know, and he said, I am so happy. And they were married, had been married a few years at that point. And he credited the therapy for being able to have that in his life. And so that was amazing. You know, we don't often get to really directly experience that. Absolutely, yeah. It's so rare and so precious when we when we really see that we've made a oh. real, real impact. And I know what you mean. Like it's for me too. You know, once in a while, there's an email or something, and it's like it's like wow. Like I'm so glad that I was able to to reach that person in the way that they need it in that moment. And oh, I'm telling you, it, uh, it's the best job in the world. It's the mayor, the best job in the world. You know, you, you cannot put it into words. Yeah. When people say, what do you do? <laughs> How can we say what we do? I know. Someone asked me recently, like, if you couldn't do this, what would you do? And I was just stumped. I was like, I don't know. <laughs> you know? <laughs> <laughs> well, you know something? I mean, I'm not really making plans to retire because uh, it's so enriching. And there's so much that keeps growing. Yeah, you know, I keep growing, and uh, I just love it. Yeah, don't retire, Susan. I don't think I may not. You've got too much to too much good to offer. <laughs> <laughs> Vincent, you're really delightful.
Yeah. I mean, really, I, did, I, I have really, really enjoyed this conversation. It's much more than I anticipated. It's a real in-depth conversation. It's been an exchange. Yeah, you know? absolutely. Yeah, that's that's what I believe in. You know, I, it's got to be real. It's got to be real people and really, you know, kind of getting in there into this, this uh, the soul of the soul of the matter so yeah what can bring more joy than two real people connecting huh yeah, yeah <laughs> absolutely and we need that as therapists as well don't we um, ah because it's tough it's tough and we need that too yeah. yeah there is no question again to anybody who might be new to this we need a lot of support yeah big time. and um uh friends and uh, places where we could let it all hang out, let it rip and totally be ourselves with one another. So Absolutely. rejuvenating and we, we do need it. Yeah. A journey back to ourselves. That's okay. right. Yeah. Okay. That's right. So look, I mean, I can't, I'm, be, I'm without words. I'm, I'm so grateful and so, um, I don't know, like, delighted. I think you said oh. delighted, <laughs> delighted to have had this opportunity, Susan. So thank you again. for. for My time. heart is touched. <laughs> Truly, <laughs> and, I, and I feel the same. Yeah. So I, thank you so much for this opportunity.